right, guys, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. I wanted to go through this run data analysis presentation with you guys. If you've had a chance to join ECS in the past, uh, this is a presentation that I've given a couple times. Um, it's one that I think is really informative for anybody that's just starting out uh, into some basic data analysis, taking a look at any of the um, you know, basic charts um, and run data stuff. So this is gonna go strictly off the presentation. I'm not gonna hop into Training Peaks today and get into any of the new stuff that's out there, um, but this should get anybody oriented and started. So let's go ahead and jump right in today. All right, so first part of the presentation. Um, big thing I want you guys to understand um, is that we're first gonna talk about bias. Uh, so before we hop even into talking about Training Peaks, need to set the stage for you guys. So all of us show bias when it comes to what information we take in. We typically focus on anything that agrees with the outcome that we want. So what does that really mean? Uh, well, we've got two things to consider. We've got bias and we've got variance. Um, so if we take a look at the slide here real quick, um, you know, think about this in terms of the grouping of intervals for a workout with an athlete. Uh, and one of the things that I want you guys to see is that um, you know, more bias but less variance would still be considered a good workout. They're all grouped together. It depends on some of the conditions, some of the other things that athlete might be dealing with. Um, still a good workout. We start to move towards more bias, more variance. That athlete's going to have a couple, you know, in the range that we ask them to be in, uh, but they're going to kind of be scattered all over the place. They may have started off too hard, faded, but maybe still hit the mark. You know, what are we really trying to get at? Ideally, a low amount of bias and a low amount of variance. So big three things, every workout should have a purpose. So did they hit the mark that you defined for them? Uh, when you're reviewing the data, these are what we call facts, uh, before you review the comments. This is so, so important. Uh, so many times uh, as coaches, we get stuck in the idea that, uh, you know, we, we have to, um, you know, ultimately, look at the facts first, then move and see what they said. Because sometimes athletes are really bad at defining a good workout from a bad workout. That's why we ultimately use training peaks and why we use data. Psychologically, we will look for bad if an athlete shares bad feelings and vice versa. So if you, if you read the comments and they say, oh man, this workout was awful, well, you're gonna look for the awful in that workout. So I want to really kind of also center where we fit as coaches. So there's objective and subjective data. So what the facts say and what confirms your belief. Our job fits right in the middle of this diagram. So right at the data analysis and kind of coaching paradigm. Uh, but this is ultimately what we call confirmation bias. Um, and we kind of have to filter that out. Um, again, if we, the confirmation bias would say that if someone says that this was a bad workout, then we're gonna go look for bad. So pretty key stuff here. All right, let's hop into the actual analysis side of things now that we're kind of centered on uh, what we're actually here to do. So data is the summary of a thousand stories. Tell the story to give it meaning. So you're feeling pretty overwhelmed. Uh, I am. Uh, this, uh, this chart definitely can be uh, something that when it first comes up is overwhelming. Um, you know, there's just a lot to look at and it's hard to define, you know, success and failure from within just a single view. Uh, so as we kind of dive into this, um, I like to kind of strip things away. Let's make things very simple. I'm still a pen and paper kind of guy. Um, you know, for me, I, I really want to uh, know what's the goal of the workout and then start to dive in to see how well they hit it. So if you guys take a look at the presentation, uh, this is seven by four minutes at marathon pace down to 10K pace. So we should see a progression. Uh, within the interval. Uh, so that's two minutes at marathon pace, cutting down the final two minutes. Uh, the goal of the work is turnover and get in roughly 30 minutes of work near or below marathon pace. Uh, so if you take a look, uh, part of the reason I write it out is it really helps kind of define what's happening here. Uh, you can see that these are four minute intervals, you know, plus or minus, uh, you know, a, a half second here. Um, we see Intensity factor, you know, being consistent throughout, maybe rising a little bit, falling a little bit, uh, but really staying really close. Uh, decoupling is, you know, in the negative, and we can talk about why we see that. We'll talk about that towards the end. Um, 
we'll see that the average heart rate throughout the interval itself is uh, increasing throughout. Uh, cadence stays roughly the same. Um, but here's where things get, a, it get pretty cool is you can actually watch the athlete cut down each interval, 649 all the way down to 639 average pace. Um, and the reason I have arrows um, and then the space between uh, 136, 137, you see there is I wanted to see what the heart rate got to um, at the bottom of the rest interval. So the, the lowest point that it hit. And you can see that that's also rising throughout, which is pretty normal, but it's not very drastic. It's about three beats. Um, so the athlete was getting fatigued, but this wasn't you know crazy, crazy hard for them. So write out all the factors in order, and I'll show you guys a great slide you can screen capture after this. Um, and then review for any increasing or decreasing trends. We can see everything that's happening here in this by writing it all out. Yes, it takes a little bit more time, um, but at the end of the day, that's what the client's paying you for, uh, to do this level of analysis. So I consider this just a basic overview. Um, and then everything that I kind of spieled out there about you know, a solid cut down, you know, a natural lift and heart rate throughout, those are your comments. Those are the things that you're putting into uh, training peaks and kind of giving the athlete his feedback. It's one thing to give feedback, but then what do we do with that information? What are we telling them? We're telling them that they're in good shape. We're telling them that they are you know, in, a, in a great place for performance. So here is the objective data review. As I said, um, this is where I pull everything from. You can see the one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, next piece here uh, is looking at the actual intervals. So, you know, objective visual data. Uh, so here's a couple notes worth taking. Uh, we're gonna talk about heart rate and speed. You know, what's the rate of change? Are we seeing a rapid increase in heart rate uh, that doesn't come with a rapid increase in speed? Uh, you know, again, any of those, uh, you know, inverse relationships. An initial spike and drop off. Was there pretty poor pacing? What's their recovery heart rate? Um, and we'll talk about one thing called overhang. So um, as we kind of go through this, there's a few more here. Uh, big things I want you guys to talk to take a look at is, did you notice any bad data? Was there anything that was just a huge spike? Did they hit two minutes per mile on a, a long, slow run? Something like that, that you know is bad, that's gonna throw off your analysis. Um, and then do you see any drift? Do you see any just objective trend that throughout that long run, we're seeing kind of a gentle rise, uh, but pace is staying the same. Now that's gonna tell us that they are becoming less efficient. So let's talk about finding trends. This is something I absolutely love. Um, and this is where we really uncover a second story. Um, so if the first story is the one that we're being told by the athlete, we're actually gonna take that in second. This is the one that we're gonna wanna hop in first, but to many, this is the second story um, and what's really happening behind the scenes and what your watch is picking up on your runs. So general trends, overhangs, troughs, and then decoupling and efficiency. So uh, as we look at um, this little graph here, now notice I only have uh, heart rate and pace. Uh, so as the athlete um, you know, went out and did this test, uh, we can see that heart rate, you know, really ramped up, um, but we can see that there's some really weird spikes uh, in, in this athlete's uh, speed. And so that just tells us that there was some poor pacing. You know, they got about, you know, maybe halfway into it and really tried to hammer for some reason um, and just really didn't pay off for them because uh, we can now see that the green line is now trending downward with that heart rate really high. This was just kind of a silly, silly thing to do. Um, for a, a 5K fitness test, um, you know, uh, this athlete would come back later and uh, blow away this mark uh, with some focused cues on pacing. But again, sometimes you have to let athletes make some mistakes uh, and use the data later uh, to show them what you're seeing. Um, this is something that I think is really cool. Uh, I usually have a ruler on my desk, uh, but you know, if I don't have one, uh, I might grab something like a straight edge. Uh, to be able to kind of put up on my monitor and be able to uh, assess some, um, you know, some of the lines that get a little bit longer over longer workouts. Uh, this is a 22 mile long run for one of my marathon runners. Um, and we could see that, you know, he was getting really inefficient uh, throughout this workout. Um, 
you know, heart rate started to fade a little bit. It was a warm day. Um, you know, fueling wasn't great. Hydration wasn't great. And so we can see um, that, you know, the athlete's becoming more and more inefficient. We see a decoupling of 12.6% uh, right here. Um, and so that ultimately um, really makes it difficult, um, you know, for this athlete. Uh, and, and you can see that he hit about, I believe these comments, he hit around 17 and a half, 18. Um, and finally that nutrition kicked in uh, that they took at 16 and they were able to kind of right a few wrongs and finish a little bit stronger and kind of lift that heart rate again. Um, but you know, overall this was a, this is a C plus workout. Um, you know, the athlete could have definitely done better for fueling and hydration and suffered the effects. So uh, next thing we're going to take a look at here is called heart rate overhang. And I think this is such a great thing to look at, especially early on as you're assessing an athlete's readiness to perform, but also uh, you might be assessing an athlete's ability to um, you know, know their body and know how well um, and how fit they are. Uh, so as we look at this workout, if we're not looking at straight lines and things, and we're just taking a glance over this, um, you know, we can see the heart rate overhang uh, well into the recovery period of the athlete. And you can see that there's a big difference between the um, on section of the interval and then the recovery section of the interval. But one thing I want to bring to your attention um, is that this is a, you know, jogging or, um, you know, jog recovery. Uh, so we're not going to see as dramatic of a drop off um, that we would expect to see with a walking interval, but, um, you know, we have to take into consideration some environmental factors. Uh, was it very hot? How fit is the athlete? These are reasons that we'd see that heart rate, heart rate stay high. Uh, but one thing that's really key here is that uh, even as the athlete slowed down, that heart rate still continued to increase up. Um, and just what that tells us is that athlete um, isn't fully fit yet. Um, and as we take a look at this next slide, uh, we start to see, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, the, the cues on this workout were to hit the interval um, pace. So hit pace by all means necessary. This was really about finding that comfort in the discomfort. This was the middle of a summer interval session. Um, and so to be able to maintain pace, if you look at the green line, uh, is where I'll draw your attention first, is that, you know, we had to eventually start lowering that recovery pace, eventually down to about a walk. Uh, to be able to get that athlete to hit that interval. Um, and he, he was able to do it. Um, but we can see that, you know, it, it, it comes back to as a coach, what are you giving as your cues to your athletes? Are you giving them, uh, you know, something as simple as, hey, I want you to nail the pace, even if that means you have to walk in between the intervals? Uh, are you hitting a certain heart rate and we're not worried about a time for recovery in between intervals? Um, and then one of the big things you can see is the decreasing recovery heart rate. Um, you can see that uh, once the athlete uh, got to a point where he wasn't able to get his heart rate down enough, he was really, really suffering um, on those. And you can see how long the overhang and the increase is there. So once we started to walk, we could see that that heart rate, recovery heart rate, started to come back down uh, and became more manageable to finish the workout. So this is how an athlete can absolutely rescue a workout. Um, and this is the data perspective of it. Um, and this was just an athlete knowing themselves uh, over years and years of interval training. So we're going to talk now about decoupling. This one always seems to confuse people, um, but I think it's, uh, it's one that, that makes complete sense uh, when, once you give it a, a good logical review. Um, so decoupling kind of works in two ways. Um, what we're looking for here is one constant relationship. So think of an imagine a flat line and then some sort of uh, divergent or convergent relationship. Either it's going to increase away from the solid line um, or it's going to drop away. Um, and so when we think about a positive and divergent relationship, so where uh, one line parts and in, in this example, the heart rate is staying the same and the pace is slowing down, um, we're gonna see a really high positive uh, percentage of correlation, meaning 14.3% uh, in the decouple because that heart rate stayed the same, but the athlete became less and less efficient, so inefficient, 14.3%. Um, so you can start to see such a large gap. Um, and that, that makes sense, you know. We could also see the same that if the pace maintained 
uh, and that heart rate started to go up, we'd also see a positive relationship. That one tends to really make it click for people, is that as that heart rate starts to get higher and higher, but pace stays the same, oh yeah, we'd see a positive relationship. Um, where people get a little bit stuck here is when we see a negative relationship. Um, and why would we see one? Well, if heart rate stayed the same and our pace increased, well, we're not robots. It's very rare that uh, we kind of have, uh, you know, a, an operating speed. You know, we're not an engine that's more efficient at 5,000 RPM than it is at 3,000 RPM. Um, if we're gonna go faster, then our heart rate is gonna have to go up with it because we're, we're demanding more from our energy systems. But here's the thing, what's a scenario where we can actually increase our speed and have our heart rate stay the same or even decrease? If we're running downhill, a pretty gentle downhill, something where we can get some good speed but it's not too technical that now it becomes really highly muscularly demanding. Um, and so that's when we'd see a negative correlative relationship. Again, the inverse here is if heart rate's going down and pace uh, is, is going up or maintaining. We're gonna see a negative relationship there. So if you see one and you're only looking at uh, you know, pace and heart rate, then you're absolutely gonna need to take a look at your graph uh, for elevation. And if the athlete's headed downhill, it's gonna make a whole lot of sense there. Um, and that's usually the two relationships we see, that 0% relationship. Um, that's when uh, everything is kind of matching. You're matching your heart rate is going up if your pace is going up, if your pace is going down, your heart rate's going down with it. We wanna see those two things match. Um, you know, if we're looking, say, what's a good relationship, because it's very rare that we'll have this, these two perfect parallel lines. And ultimately, we're looking for, um, you know, a zero to 5% relationship. Um, so that's really what uh, we're looking for. Zero to 5% is what we call optimal or ideal. Last thing here um, is just a couple of key points. I know I skipped over a slide there, but it's just a reiteration of uh, the uh, inverse or negative relationship that we'd see. Uh, be conscious to bias and variance. Um, you know, click analyze before you read comments. Uh, it just ensures that you're taking the data at face value and not taking in any of that bias uh, from your client. Um, take a few extra seconds, write things down, you know, actually look at uh, you know, what's happening? Is that athlete, um, you know, are we seeing some trends there? Are some poor pacing? Are there things that you need to correct that'll be very helpful notes that are beyond just kind of the gobbledygook of heart rate, pace, and cadence? And then lastly, look for trends. You know, take a look at data over time. Um, you know, this is looking at one specific workout. Uh, you can get WKO5 and really start to look at all these other big, huge trends and get into some way, way nerdy stuff. Super cool, um, but by majority, you can coach with the tools that are given to you through Training Peaks and do a phenomenal job. So uh, with all that said, I just wanna say thanks. Um, you know, this is a presentation that I've given many times. I know it's, uh, it's a pretty quick one, uh, just under 20 minutes. Uh, but it really helps orient people to what they're doing in Training Peaks. So if this was helpful, please, please, please give us a like, uh, subscribe. If you want more of this, put in the comments uh, what you'd like to see more from me. Um, I love to dive into the nerdy side of things. By background, I'm an engineer turned coach. Uh, so if I can offer any more insights to you guys, please, those comments help guide future videos. Have a good one, and we'll talk to you guys soon.